What's up guys, Chris here with part 2 of my JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Steel Ball Run review series. Part 2, like I mentioned in part 1, is actually just these stand battles of me going through each and every individual fights. But either it'll be generalized or it will be in a bit more detail going over my thoughts on each individual fight and how the story progressed and with my own general thoughts. And we'll end off with the midway point of Steel Ball Run, which is where I think would be a good place for it to end off. This is literally just going to be me going over the fights, so I hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, part 3 will be up within a week from this, if things are going well in terms of me getting the video out and recorded. So let's see if I can keep myself on schedule. But it'll be a lot more compact than parts 1 and 2, as I'm just going to be going over the story beat by beat. And it's going to be a bit more generalized with me focusing on certain aspects instead of the other, and not going over every single fight every step of the way. But with that out of the way, let's get right into part 2 of my Steel Ball Run review. Let's get going. So first off, I just want to say I like the opening race in Stage 1, as it does end up setting up what we're going to see. A lot of strategy involving horse races, and introducing a lot of the major characters, like Gyro Zeppeli, Johnny Joestar. Poco Loco, who we don't really see too much of. Sandman, we see this version's, this part's version of Dio Brando, who is a secondary antagonist to the group, and is one of the main objectives for the current Jojo and Gyro to encounter and battle, and he ends up playing along with the main villain for now. And like I said, the first stage is literally just a race. Poco Loco managing to almost narrowly make it the first due to just sheer luck and even giving us our first full look at a stand which makes me curious how poco loco awakened the stand was he born with it did he come in contact with a body part previously or did he somehow enter and just survive a devil's palm or was he born with it i have no idea but he does have a lot of comedy in this aspect and what makes this whole thing interesting with him is that he seems to have the best luck out of everyone, he starts last in the race, and he somehow makes it the first within uh, within less time, somehow, and the worst things could potentially happen to him, but some good things can end up happening as well, so his luck is honestly insane. But yeah, the first stage, we see a lot of the horse race, the strategy in terms of running, and how things go for all these individual jockeys and cowboys running on horseback. And yeah, I, I the first part, the first stage, Really cool. I enjoyed it, and I just love the horse racing aspect of it. Before the second stage starts, we get introduced to Mountain Tim, ending up becoming a deputy sheriff as there was a murder of three previous participants. And it leads up to the second stage, as we do find out who these murderers are. It leaves off a mystery that I was honestly expecting to pay off for the overarching portion of this race, but the, the fact that it gets solved in the next in interaction is honestly pretty cool and I don't really mind it. Enter Mrs. Robinson. This character is interesting. I don't know, I don't think that this is a stand power. It never stated as a stand power, but I do believe it's a stand power. Miss Robinson somehow has insects within their body and ends up using them for various strategic moves, like having them vibrate at a frequency to make these sensitive cactuses punch out their needles, which is something of a defense mechanism for these plants to injure Johnny and Gyro mo a multitude of times. But Gyro, using his ability of spin and his steel balls, manages to turn the tables on him and win in the end. Honestly, my least favorite interaction out of all these different fights that we get in this arc, but still, it wasn't boring. The Boom Boom family. Honestly, not a fan of these guys' as characters, but the way they almost beat the main cast was honestly really nice. It's our first real stand battle, and it leads up to Johnny awakening a stand and us discovering that Mountain Tim himself is also a stand user. His ability, allowing himself to turn himself into rope to capture enemies or just get out of certain spaces. It's a really cool ability, somewhat uh, lackluster, but it's utilized fairly well in the story that we've seen so far and later down the road. The Boom Booms, I wouldn't say they're interesting characters, they're just one-off villains that don't really do too much. Though this is an interesting fight where our cast is magnetized and they're doomed to basically have iron pull towards each other and the closer the family gets to them, they do end up having the risk of them smashing together and just having their internal organs just splatter all over the place. Similar to what happened 
with the deaths of the three racers from right before stage two started, revealing that it was the, this group of stand users that killed them. And in the midst of all this stressful event, Johnny awakens his stand power and manages to defeat the Boom Boom family, only to realize, thanks to Mountain Tim, that they are in a Devil's Palm. So Johnny awakens his stand in a Devil's Palm and they manage to get out of there before they're lost. But the Boom Boom family is stuck in there as well. Honestly, the fight, not too amazing, but the fact that we got the Mountain Tim and the and as part of the main cast and Johnny awakening his stand, which are fingernails that can be launched as bullets, it's really cool. And it gets utilized in really creative ways as we go on. Oya Kamova has a really interesting stand ability in which it allows them to turn anything they touch into landmines with pins on it and you have to hold down the pins in order for you not to blow up like a landmine which has a bunch of interesting aspects put into this fight with Oyakamova using his abilities in very interesting ways which is honestly pretty interesting I do really like it and yeah we have a lot of interesting set pieces going through a river a dust storm wasps he turns all of these into landmines which they which the main group barely manages to get away with with Johnny managing to, with Gyro's help, turn the tables on the, on their opponent and utilizing their, the ability against him, tricking him, and landing a decisive blow with the steel ball, basically ending the fight. Honestly, I, this was the first real high-stakes fight, I really have to say, that I found really interesting in Steel Ball Run. Nothing too crazy, but the idea of someone that can turn anything they touch into landmines and trying to figure out a creative way to utilize your stand power to trick them and to get a clean hit was honestly really nice. Pork Pie Hat Kid. Honestly, this is a really interesting fight. This didn't last super long, but it was interesting. They use a, they fight against a stand user with the ability called Wire, which allows him to use wenches with hooks from his mouth, puts them in a plate of water to teleport them from different aspects, whether it be insects, feathers, or even another human being or living creature, he's able to basically hook them like fish and reel them up. And this adds a layer of mystery and tension as this happens to Gyro getting taken out of the fight fairly early. And with some interesting aspects, Johnny is left the fight alone. For his stand, for us to actually see the full design of Johnny's stand and seeing him manage to take down Pork Pie all on his own, yes, Gyro did do some help in terms of pointing Johnny in the right direction to find the location of the stand user, but either way, this was really nice in terms of developing Johnny and having him come to terms with his ability to try and keep moving. Hell, he, we even get an interesting aspect where Johnny turns his toenails into spin bullets and uses that to help himself move. Honestly, this is a nice cat and mouse game where Johnny does some fairly interesting stuff to manage to land some hits on the stand user, even managing to use the stand user's own ability against him, which is a classic Joestar way of doing things. And while it seems like Johnny had no choice in order to save Gyro, he had to give up part of the corpse that he was holding without realizing it, but Gyro in that last instance managed to make the nails spin and uses them to hit Pork Pie and kill him, ending the fight. Thus ensuing the quest to try and find out what's going on and having the two of them fully come to terms with trusting each other with their own backstories and their reason. And now sets up the overarching mystery and quest to find the rest of the corpse pieces for the main cast. Scary Monsters. This is honestly a very, very interesting set of chapters. An interesting mini arc as basically Dio is our main antagonist for this portion of the arc with the mystery of what's going on with Dio after a chance encounter and realizing that Dio becoming a dinosaur somehow, which honestly, when I first read this, I thought, this is Dio's stand ability. It's very different, but I'm okay with it. It's very interesting and it changes things for Dio. But as we move on, we see that this ability is like a virus. Once you're cut with the, the claws of a dinosaur, particularly right now Dio, you become a dinosaur, whether it be mice, other people, you sl or dead corpses, you become a dinosaur. And Johnny and Gyro are slowly turning into them as they race to find the next corpse piece, as they find out where it is, and they have to get there before they fully become dinosaurs, become mindless slaves to the stand user. 
and the reveal that Dio isn't even the person that had the stand, he was a victim of this power, is honestly a really nice twist. And then we end up coming on to the next batch of corpse pieces, which are the eyes. And this, I have to say, is really cool because it all comes down to Johnny willingly giving up his, his the arm that he had to become a dinosaur, so that he's able to knock the eyes out of the out of the actual stand user's hands and get it over to Gyro, so he could use it to resist the stand the stand user's power for a bit. But in the end, even after defeating the stand user, Dio takes the other eye and he, in turn, becomes a stand user as well, turning the stand power that was used on him and becoming it his own. So, now he has the ability to turn things into dinosaurs now and become a dinosaur himself. Honestly, fairly interesting. I was honestly expecting it to be a reveal like, Dio now can use the world from part three. I wouldn't be opposed to that. I don't think anybody would be opposed to that. It fits Dio's character regardless. But, this is a really interesting twist and leads into more interesting battles to come. So yeah, Dio now has a corpse part, and now he is searching for other parts similar to, jo to Johnny and Gyro. So now they have a rival for this whole aspect of the race in order to find the missing pieces. Definitely one of my favorite uh, fights in Back to Chapters in this part so far. And Dio does steal the show because he still has the charisma that he had in previous parts, even though this is a different version of him. So I'm really happy that he's not a one-off villain and he's going to be a recurring, char recurring character in this part. As Dio is a constant threat to the to Gyro and Johnny, so they constantly have to be on their toes to try and get ahead of Dio so we don't lose to him in the race or in the quest to find the missing pieces. Mandam. Now this, this is a really cool stand power. So Johnny and Gyro on the path to the next stage end up encountering a character called Hot Pants with a stand ability that uses their own flesh as a weapon, whether to heal or to just suffocate somebody, or it's used in a variety of different ways, which is an interesting power. But the three of them end up coming across an old house out on their route, and they discover Ringo Road again, and a stand bond them, which is a time-based stand. So early in this part, and we already have a character with a time-based stand, I thought this guy was going to be important through, through, through the overarching arc of the story, but no, he's only in this one mini-arc, and it's perfectly fine. This stand power allows him to rewind time by 6 seconds, and at the start of this batch of chapters, we see that the main group have been trying to get out of this one area, but they keep looping back around to the same spot over and over and over again, and it's revealed that that road again has been using his stand to rewind time six seconds every time to the point where the, these characters have been losing roughly an hour of their time thinking that they're going around in circles wondering what's going to happen and we see various attempts for them to beat road again but he keeps rewinding time somehow to the point where he ends up having the upper hand every single time this leads into johnny being knocked unconscious same with hot pants and gyro injured leading to a final confrontation between the two of them in a true standoff. Where we actually get Rodigan's origin story, which is honestly very tragic and messed up as his family was poor and lived out in the countryside, being, being deemed as traitors due to his, the actions of his, of his father. One night, his whole family is murdered by a deranged man who, from what I can tell, was a deserter from the army, and kills his mother and sisters and begins to force himself on him. Ringo managing at the very last second to shoot and kill this man to save his life. And in that instance, his frail body felt whole again. He did not feel like he was constantly being injured because he had a condition where he kept bleeding. And he began to find a path forward and follow that path to wherever it led him so that his life would be easier. Which leads into the confrontation between Gyro and and wrote again in a final confrontation where gyro actually uses his stand for the first time well we truly see his stand for the first time with the ability to scan objects and people with x-ray vision managing to land a hit gyro continues to exploit rodigan's ability to rewind time multiple times and after certain aspects gyro gets one over as he managed to memorize where the debris lands and utilize that to stop Rodigan from using his stand power and winning in the end. 
with it then being revealed at the end that Rodigan actually sent a carrier pigeon to find the president and inform him of what's to come, who has the corpse pieces and where the next one lies. But yeah, this is honestly one of my favorite fights in this part. I know I didn't describe it all too well, but Rodigan had a really awesome stand power, being able to rewind time multiple times for his favor, but ends up losing due to Gyro's stand ability being able to scan everything and memorizing where certain debris pieces, the debris fall around and utilizing that to prevent from using stand power within a six second interval so he wouldn't be able to rewind time. Lucy Steele and Blackmore. Now this was an interesting arc of chapters because not only did this utilize a type of cat and mouse game where Lucy manages to figure out what the president is planning and tries to stop it, fearing for her husband's life, but also Blackmore who soon figures out that Lucy is the one who is behind taking the message of the location of the next corpse piece, which is the spine, which Rode again managed to figure out after capturing Johnny in the previous bunch batch of chapters. And so, after Mount and Tim comes and saves her, she goes off to find the next uh, corpse piece while Mount and Tim fights off Blackmore. With Mount and Tim sadly dying in a fight against him, not knowing the true nature of Blackmore's stand ability, which allows him to solidify the water and raindrops, making it so that they are like blades. With Blackmore figuring out that Lucy is behind taking the message from Road again to the president, he goes off to try and find her. And this leads into Lucy finding the spine and trying to find Johnny and Gyro, who have been fighting Dio, who is also on his way to find the spine. So they have a two battle front, Lucy, a non-stand user, fighting against a stand user, while Johnny and Gyro are fighting off against Dio in a race to claim the next corpse piece. Lucy manages to seemingly kill Blackmore or leave him, or leave him for dead, after shooting him a multitude of times. She then meets up with Johnny and Gyro as they just barely manage to beat Dio and kind of break his spirits in a really satisfying manner. Though, I have to admit, seeing D Dio lose is honestly pretty fun considering now he has to become the underdog and take down Johnny and Gyro once, once all is said and done. And this whole horse racing aspect is played into the stand battle because Dio constantly uses his dinosaur ability to turn stuff like fleas into dinosaurs to attack Gyro's horse. Gyro managing to outwit Dio and him and Johnny working together managed to cause Dio to, to lose his horse, have his horse be injured and basically be knocked out of the race temporarily and unable to claim the corpse piece. After running into Lucy, they are begin to be told the situation that the president is the one behind it and they still want to know who is responsible or who the identity of the corpse is. We then get a pretty fun and really cool battle between Blackmore who manages to use his stand power to keep himself from bleeding out. But eventually, through some really quick witted use of spin by Gyro, managed to land a decisive blow on Blackmore and once he was knocked unconscious, his stand ability deactivated and he bled out and died. With the final corpse part entering Johnny, revealing the next three corpse part locations. So this wasn't really too much of a fight in terms of the Blackmore portion, but the but the intrigue of how the enemy are viewing the fact that there might be a traitor or someone that is out looking for the corpse pieces along with them and trying to sabotage them is really cool. As right now with Blackmore dead, they don't know what's going on or who the person sabotaging them actually is which Lucy has to remain unwitting. She has to just play the part, stay as Steele's wife, and not draw any attention to herself. But Gyro gives her his right eye, the eye that was part of the corpse that he had, and kept it with her so that she could find an opportunity to go and steal whatever parts that the president had, to keep it away from him, and to stop his grand master plan, whatever it may be. So that is another plot point that we'll get back to later. What is interesting is that Dio strikes a deal with the president stating that he wants Manhattan in return for the eye that he has, the identity of the traitor, and even taking back the parts that were given and taken by Gyro and, and Johnny. And Gyro even asks for another stand user to be his accomplice and his partner 
to help take down Jaro as a team, and the president begrudgingly agrees and gives him a stand user, who we then re we then learn their identity and their ability, which is honestly pretty interesting, and it's used in very creative ways with Dio's power. Which now, let's get into the next portion, A Silent Way. In this section, J Jaro and Johnny end up having to battle Sandman, a character who is the first person we actually interact with in this whole series, the, f the first point of view character, who enters this, this race in order to have the money to buy the land back from the US in order to make it better for his people. And he is revealed to be the one that the president sent with Dio to take down Jaro and Johnny. And what ensues is Dio utilizing his dinosaur powers in a very unique way, turning plants and crops into dinosaurs, flying dinosaurs and some mini raptor type things with Sandman's power, A Silent Way, where he's able to write certain sounds on it similar to echoes from part four where once you come in contact with it, the effect activates, whether it be burning, slashing, cutting, all that happens, and we have to see Johnny and Gyro learning how to deal with it. And they're basically on the defensive for the majority of this whole fight, trying to find a way to find the stand user who is actually hiding in the brush. And there's actually an instance where we get a, a fake out, a red herring, where we think it is the Japanese racer, especially since written on the dinosaurs is the Japanese uh, wording in kanji for everything that happens. So yeah, that's very interesting. This, this section also dives more into Johnny's backstory, but I already basically covered the gist of it earlier when I was talking about Johnny, so I won't get too into it, but it does lead into more growth for Johnny as him and Gyro are stuck in the river injured from this fight, with Gyro trying to keep Johnny f from uh, half-assing it, and basically makes it so that Johnny has to learn more about spin, the next lesson, and teaches him about the golden ratio. Now, I do not have a degree in mathematics, so I or architecture, so I can't talk about the golden ratio as in detail as Gyro does in this section. All you gotta know is that it is the basis for spin and being able to like follow the course inf and spin infinitely. But yeah, the two of them are stuck in a river, and Jaro injures himself, protecting Johnny from behind, from, an, from a whole attack from these sound creatures. And this leads into Johnny basically breaking down, wondering what is he going to do, he can't do this, until he be, actually begins to figure out what Jaro meant in terms of the golden ratio and how spin works. And in doing so, his stand evolves, and we see it with how his stand looks entirely differently, and his power alters in a really awesome way, where before he only spun his finger, finger and toenails as disc bullets that went at high speeds, that only went in straight directions. But now, he's able to shoot his fingers like actual pistols with 10 shots, and after it hits something, it curves and it follows up until a certain point when it hits its intended target. And it's honestly really cool seeing how this ability has evolved over this entire fight, leading to Sandman finding cool and unique ways to avoid Johnny's bullets, and even bringing everything down to a standoff between Johnny and Sandman, where they both have one shot to win. Johnny with only one finger bullet left, and Sandman having all the advantage right now, despite being injured to take down Johnny figuring out how his ability ends up working. Johnny almost gets him by getting his heart, but then Sandman manages to avoid a lethal blow to his heart, leaving Johnny with no ammo left. But right when Sandman thinks he's won, Johnny manages to use one of the uh, one of the steel plates that Gyro had on him and use a spin to create a steel ball, using his stand to land a lethal blow, killing Sandman in the end. With Sandman wishing nothing nothing but for her sister to be well and to be safe. Honestly, I did not expect Sandman to die in this this early section of the arc. I thought he was going to become a part of the main JoJo crew, similar to how Mountain Tim, but he ended up dying. So I don't know who else is going to be part of this group because right now it's basically Lucy, Jaro, and Johnny, and I believe Hot Pants to an extent, as we'll get into a little bit later. 
But yeah, honestly, this is probably like my second favorite fight outside of the fight between Rodigan and Gyro utilizing the whole time re rewind thing. And this one really does help with the development of Johnny as a character and just showing all the different things happening with Johnny and the stand evolution. Having his powers evolve in that one fight, coming to terms with his own weakness and moving past, past it and figuring out more to spin, which in turn helps his stand evolve, which is also based off of the power of spin. I am sad that Sandman had to die. I thought he was actually going to be part of the main group, some, but I guess uh, Araki is making it so that not every character is going to be safe. I mean, that's kind of how Jojo rolls at times. But it would have been nice to have someone like Sandman with his really cool and unique stand power to fight against the main villain. But either way, really awesome fight. I enjoyed it. And Johnny had some really awesome development in this fight, which only gets to be further portrayed in the next in the next batch of chapters. But this interaction ends with Johnny being knocked unconscious and having the corpse parts that he had, the left arm and the spine, taken from him by Hot Pants, who leaves a portion of it in Johnny so he could still use a stand ability and so they could potentially be useful to finding more corpse pieces. As Hot Pants does seem to be part of the same government as Zep as Gyro, so that's an interesting thing to go about it, and it adds a bit more complexity. In terms of there being other factions watching over Gyro, showing that he was most likely sent here on this race to uncover these corpse pieces. Now we're on to the second last section of the video. Sugar Mountain. Now this, this isn't a full on action set piece until later down the road, but I do like the implications of this. As Gyro and Johnny, trying to escape a group of horsemen on horseback, try to get Johnny uh, Gyro's steel ball back from a mysterious girl who goes into a tree trunk. And after a series of questions and stuff like that, they realize that this girl is part of a bizarre stand power, where she presents whatever has been knocked in the river to them along with something else. If they lie, something will happen to them and they'll get stuck in the tree. But if they tell the truth, not only will they get what they lost back, but they'll get something else, like a diamond and gold. And eventually, after Jaro figures everything out, they eventually, through doing this the right way, telling the truth with every single instance, manage to get the ears of the corpse, as well as like over $100,000 or something like that, which is a lot of money. But yeah, this ends up leading into more of the technical give and take aspect of this ability, this power. Where, essentially, once you obtain something from the tree, you have to use up everything you've obtained through this ability by sunset, or else become a part of the tree, and become a guardian, which has happened to the squirrel and her parents and countless others, who haven't been able to spend whatever they received from the tree by sunset. And the only way for everyone to be set free is, essentially, if they manage to use up everything that they've been given. This leads Johnny and Jaro in a last ditch effort to try and get rid of not just diamond and gold, but also all the cash that they have as well. Everything that they've gained from her ability that they didn't originally that didn't originally belong to them. We see them trying to give it, give this stuff away, but they end up becoming tree parts and begin to melt into the ground and be brought into the tree until they take that stuff back. Which means. In order for them to get rid of the money and the gold, they have to sell it. They have to trade it for something of equal value, otherwise they'll become a part of the tree. Now this ends up adding a bit more stuff into it, a bit more complexity, as... Well, they're being encountered by 11 individuals. They try and spend a lot of money by eating a crap ton of food, buying a building, spending money on horses, finding other technicalities and stuff like that, but in the end, whatever they end up doing, they end up making more money, which ends up being hilarious. Even though this is a high-stakes situation, they end up just not losing all the money. This is like a classic comedic situation with undertones of them basically potentially, well, dying a gruesome death or being a part of a tree for the rest of their life, being doomed to repeat a constant and unending cycle. This all comes to a head when they're in a casino trying to win back their money and trying to lose it all in a casino since it's a technicality and stuff like that. But then, this group of mercenaries come in, who, well, they aren't a group of mercenaries, they're just one person, one stand user, who was able to split himself up into a multitude of people, 11 seemingly to be precise, 
and they then begin a full-on massacre in the casino, where Johnny and Gyro are heavily injured from the bullets and are trying to find a way to get rid of all of the clones of this guy and survive. Which honestly leads to really fun and really cool usage of Johnny's stand abilities and Gyro's spin. But in the end, they're stuck behind a pillar outnumbered and not sure what to do next. Especially since, even if you kill one, the other clones will pop out of one of the corpses and they keep moving from corpse to corpse. In the end, when they are basically about to lose, Gy Gyro manages to come in with the save. As he actually managed to pay all of the other gunmen and gamblers in the area and bodyguards as bodyguards by paying them for string and to protect them from the guy that's doing it because earlier we saw that they weren't getting involved but he paid them with gold the diamond and all the money that they had and gained and thus they finished their transaction with the girl and they managed to complete it and right when they think that they're all set up they used up everything they had Suddenly, Gyro begins to meld with the wall and slowly becomes part of the tree. Until then, Johnny figures out why this is happening. The transaction wasn't complete, because the money and the gold wasn't the only thing they gained. It was the corpse pieces, the arm and the ears. Which means they have to give it up or trade it in for something in order for Gyro to be taken care of. Johnny's perfectly fine, Gyro was the one who is being taken by the tree, and Gyro is slowly being pulled into the wall, much by Johnny's sheer shock and horror, and he's having an internal conflict. What am I going to do? It's sunset. Do I give up all this? Do I give up my purpose being in this race to save Gyro, or do I get, or do I give it up, or do I give up Gyro to, to doom to die, condemning my friend in order to basically end up saving myself? And this. I have to say, leads to honestly one of my favorite decisions and moments. Johnny refusing to give give the corpse parts away because he doesn't want to, with that being the last thing that Gyro sees, and gets pulled away into the tree as Johnny laments over his decision. The girl thinks that it's a shame because she thought that Gyro and Johnny were going to be the ones to end this curse, this endless cycle. Until a few pages later, we realize and see that her parents disappeared and, jo and Gyro was being returned to normal. And that could only happen if Johnny gave up the pieces. As revealed, as Johnny's crying on the ground, he gave the pieces to the gunman that was trying to kill them earlier as a transaction to leave them alone. And Johnny tells him to get out of here. So they, lo so they ended up losing the pieces that they gained right in this instance. And Johnny did that to save his friend. Johnny had everything right now. He had the way of the court. He had what he wanted. And that could have made him a lot stronger in the end. And potentially even helped him find the other pieces. Now, seeing him give it all up. Putting them at such a huge disadvantage just to get his friend back is honestly really heartwarming and wholesome. It was honestly one of my favorite moments in this whole section of the story. And I was originally going to end it here. Because even though Johnny is crying on the ground over his decision and had to do it to save his friend, Gyro, thinking back to his previous experiences, ends up telling Johnny, look, we lost them right now, but there are still more corpse pieces, right? So why not go after them next? Let's get the ball running and get the ball into the other net. I, I'm not going to say this in the entire speech, but, Johnny, but Gyro picks Johnny back up and tells him that it's time to head off. We're about to do something, we're about to find the other corpse pieces, so we lost them, we'll end up getting them back. Don't worry about it, and I'm going to help you along the way. Their bond, thus making their bond one of the strongest things in the series, and it's just really nice seeing that how these characters ended up growing closer together as friends, as brothers throughout this entire story, and we're only halfway done. Now, originally I was going to end off the video with this portion, but I need to talk about one last section that sets the ball back in the court of the heroes, in which case, is really cool. Dio, even though losing Sandman, gave information about who the person that, st that ended up betraying the president is, but not who exactly they were, but that, that, she, that they, it was a woman of a certain height and weight, and tells it to one of the president's right-hand men, one of his most trusted allies, and is confused on who it could possibly be, and that maybe they aren't a stand user, or if they are a stand user. And so they begin an investigation, and we get the reveal 
of this new guy's new power, which is called tubular bells, where it basically blows something up like a balloon, whether it be a solid object or a nail or something, ties it up, and it ends up taking a scent over something, and used it where the phone was called to call Mountain Tim to rescue Lucy, and now the scent of Lucy is memorized by the stand, so the second Lucy is shown, she will in fact be attacked by the sand. And this leads to us going back to Lucy's perspective. With everything that's going on, she realizes that they're looking for her and she, whatever she has to do to get the corpse pieces and help Johnny and Gyro, she has to do it now. Thus leading her to try and seduce the president's wife, Scarlet, as through process of elimination, she ends up thinking that Scarlet is into women, which ends up being correct. So Scarlet is confirmed bisexual in the series, since she is married to Funny Valentine, but is also interested in women. And this leads into her various interactions with Scarlet, end up going up to one and ends up going to the president's house, and her becoming Scarlet by copying her scent, as she previously had teamed up with Hot Pants, being given the mission to infiltrate the president's house and steal whatever corpse pieces he did in fact have, in order to keep it away from him and to stop whatever plans he's trying to do with them. And this ends up being very interesting because Lucy had to knock out Scarlet in order to infiltrate the president's room during his nap, since she mentions that there is a time of day where the president has a nap for 30 minutes. So this could be a thing regarding his stand power, or this could just be something he just does because he likes taking naps. It's never really explained. But either way, she ends up taking advantage of this and uses the ability given by Hot Pants to turn into Scarlet in order to trick the president into thinking that she is in fact his wife in order to get close enough to steal the corpse pieces. She manages to put Funny Valentine back to sleep, but because the president had his right-hand man's power tub tubular bells in his room with the scent of the traitor, the scent of Lucy, she was then attacked by the stand, injuring her in the leg. And in that instance, after being injured, Scarlet, regaining consciousness, wakes back up and sees Lucy impersonating her and realizes that she's a stand user, so obviously she knows about the stands and the corpse pieces and everything, and the two of them begin to fight, Lucy getting shot by Scarlet, but in the end, after being in a very desperate situation, Scarlet manages to turn the tables at the last minute by making Hot Pants' power transfer over to Scarlet, thus making Scarlet have the same scent as Lucy, redirecting the stand towards Scarlet, and Scarlet dying from this stand. Now Lucy, stuck in the bathroom, is now being cornered by the, one of the president's right-hand men and also the Secret Service. Hot Pants appears as basically trying to stall for time and trying to get Lucy out of there. She fights the user of tubular bells and after a desperate battle, seemingly getting dismembered multiple times and nearly killed, manages to turn the table on tubular bells using her stand in a unique way, which basically makes it so that now whenever he blows air into something, his pipes will close up, and thus he will explode. And he ends up killing himself by not listening to Hot Pants, and thus ends up kind of blowing open his own neck. And in the closing aspect of this whole section, Hot Pants escapes with the corpse pieces after it's revealed that Lucy managed to take all of them from the president. But, Hot Pants wasn't able to take all of the corpse pieces, leaving the backbone and the left arm with Lucy. And Lucy, having to use Hot Pants' power to turn back to Scarlet, she has to impersonate the, the president's wife for as long as possible, until the race is over and until the corpse pieces have been assembled and taken away out of the hands of Funny Valentine. Leaving Lucy behind enemy lines, having to deal with the fact that she is now in the care of her greatest enemy and the enemy of her of her husband not knowing what he's up to and has no real way of fighting back right now ending and that's honestly the real section snowball run has honestly been a really fun experience so far and there's 45 chapters left 50 chapters in and we already have a bunch of twists and turns Hot Pants, who seems to be kind of allied with Gyro and Johnny, but is in a different faction, going for the corpse pieces, managed to get them all away from the president. Johnny and Gyro are on their way to find another piece of the corpse after losing the, the two that they ended up gaining. Dio is still in the race and is doing things for his own gains. 
and the president is none the wiser of what's going on, yet is still stressed out and is trying to find the corpse pieces. This is all leading into something really awesome and I can't wait to see where this culminates into because we still have the race to go with and we don't even know what Funny Valentine's stand ability actually is. So I'm very curious to see where, where that's going to go and what other stand users will see because I honestly can't wait. As we're entering the end game of the story, we're at the halfway point and I'm curious to see what's going to happen next. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell for updates on future videos. It really does help. And it shows that you guys enjoy the content I make on this channel. And it actually really does help motivate me to make more JoJo's content in the future. And don't worry, part three of this review series is going to be out in a week from this video's upload in the earliest. It could be a few days late. We'll see how things go. It all depends on, my, on mine and my editor's individual schedules, along with all the other videos I have planned to do for the month. But I hope you guys enjoyed and look forward to part three of Steel Ball Run. I'm having a blast with the series and I just cannot wait to talk to you guys about the climax when I finish it.